So something related but quite different. Uh, when I saw I was put into DMT and Indian encounters, uh, I, I was excited but also aware that I'm focusing much more on entity encounters than I am I'm on DMT, although DMT will definitely be related for obvious reasons. Uh, so uh, as you were just told, um, I'm an esoteric artist, uh, primarily a filmmaker. I'm a practicing magician. Uh, well, Thank you. <laughs> it's actually a big deal being an academic and being open about that, by the way. So. <laughs> For the record, though, I'm also a skeptic and uh, I subscribe to a uh, multi model agnosticism. Uh, I'm a lecturer at the University of Northampton and uh, I'm also undertaking a practice led PhD in uh, all culture and pop cultural production. So both my personal and professional lives are deeply intertwined around this central idea of all culture. And all culture, as I'll go on to explain, subsumes psychedelia. That is to say, psychedelia, or the world of people, phenomena, and items associated with psychedelics, fall entirely within the broader sociological category of all culture. I've previously given entire presentations that cover only partially what all culture is, so let me begin by making two very quick apologies. Uh, the first one being, uh, anyone who's heard me before, I have to explain what all culture is again a little bit, so I will have to recapitulate. Uh, and secondly, for the disservice, I'll need to give this complex and nuanced concept in only providing the briefest of outlines. An outline, however, necessary to lay the groundwork for the ideas that I'll build on this key concept. And then I'm going to pull a sudden handbrake turn uh, so watch out for that uh, and, and, and talk about something related and exciting uh, but unexpected. So what is all culture? <laughs> well, it's a piece of consciously employed wordplay which is in fact an important attribute. It's a neologistic compound that is inherently entangled with otherness narrativity and mediation. All culture is also a term that is growing in popularity. That is a claim uh, which is uh, it's difficult to comprehensively evidence, but to offer a few notable recent examples. The now very popular All Culture podcast, which was launched on the 29th of September 2016, which I'll be speaking on soon, for those of you that listen. The prominent esoteric art exhibition, All Culture, the Dark Arts, which ran in 2017 in Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, through 2017 to the present, All Culture has been a popular London-based club night run by eminent scholar and esotericist Patricia McCormick. In March 2018, Carl Abrahamson released his volume, All Culture, The Unseen Forces That Drive Culture Forward, and yesterday I enjoyed a great presentation here by the founder, there she is, of the All Culture Berlin Conference uh, where I spoke last year. The word was originally coined by artist, esoterrorist, self-styled cultural engineer and experienced psychedelic explorer Genesis P. Orridge. P. Orridge recently reflected on their invention of the term in a recent review of Abrahamson's All Culture volume, where the inherent narrativity of All Culture, its story-like quality and its relation to mediation and communication is made clear. All culture is a word that was inevitable. At any given moment, our sensory environment is whispering to us, telling us hidden stories, revealing subliminal connections. This concealed dialogue between every level of popular cultural forms and magical conclusions is what we named all culture. The word all culture has also been repurposed by the Academy, first introduced as a sociological category by Christopher Partridge in The Reenchantment of the West. Partridge initially came across the term in George McKay's Senseless Acts of Beauty, but subsequently traced it back to P. Orridge, who he has now written about at some length. Partridge used the term to make sense of what he deemed to be the meaningful confluence of competing spiritual discourses within popular culture and the media. On the one hand, in the West, with widespread secularization, there was a turn away from traditional structures and forms of religion. Yet on the other hand, there remained an equally widespread and conspicuously vibrant interest in the paranormal, the pursuit of experiences of transcendence, the acquisition of occult knowledge, 
and the development of some form of mysticism or inner life spirituality. It's pretty easy to see the intimate connection with psychedelia here, especially with respect to the pursuit of experiences of transcendence and the acquisition of occult knowledge, particularly if occult is understood in its broadest possible sense. Indeed, psychedelic culture is central to Partridge's notion of all culture, with the psychedelic period of the 1960s and 1970s being, quote, enormously significant for the popular dissemination of a range of all cultural ideas, end quote. Partridge notes it is abundantly clear that psychedelic trance music, rave culture, the free festival movement, and even contemporary music festivals all continue to inform and interrelate with the countercultural and all cultural. Even here at Brayton Convention, there are all manner of all cultural artifacts, spiritual symbols, and so on. And I would say it's a fair bet that all of you might even witness the odd bit of transcendence pursuit before the weekend's out. <laughs> So within the wider semiotic soup of culture, all culture is a reservoir of ideas, beliefs, practices, and symbols that people may drink from. Of utmost importance to Partridge's understanding of all culture, however, is that it is explicitly not merely occult culture. As he explicitly clarifies in his later work on the theory, explaining that Within the idea of all culture, the occult is radically modified by the word culture. As a compound, all culture suggests a democratized occult, an open esotericism. All culture is ordinary. So all culture is ordinary. It's ubiquitous everywhere. But it still has to be distinct in some manner from culture, or it just be the same thing. So it needs to differentiate itself stand out. All culture is found everywhere that culture is, but it is also distinguished from normative culture. It deviates from the orthodox cultural faith. And this is where we start to uh, show slightly where I take the direction of all culture in my own model. And I, 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 I've chosen to uh, offer some <coughs> visual representation because I find visual metaphors help with explaining the concept a little. Um, as I say, I'm looking at one really narrow aspect of all culture, and I have written about this um, at some length, and that, that will be forthcoming soon, but I'm focusing on what's most relevant to what I want to build onto here. As I've mentioned, all culture, again, just like culture, is inherently semiotic, inherently narrative, inherently story-like. It's a category of distinctive signs that stand out from the semiotic soup, from the cultural field that it's embedded in. There's it standing out, you see. You're probably wanting to know what that... There you go, now you know. It is ordinary, that is to say normal, insofar as it's statistically common. But it is extraordinary in that it is non-normative and deviant in nature. Moreover, when our attention is drawn to it, it's also drawn beyond it. It reveals a concealed source that it signposts and points to. Although it is concurrent with all culture and ubiquitous within culture, its presence heralds radical alterity, ineffable otherness. It speaks of something unspeakable beyond the cultural field or cultural fabric. In Authors of the Impossible, scholar of religion Jeffrey Kreipel argues, rather convincingly to my mind, that paranormal events or experiences, because they are always experienced by a subject, often display profound semiotic, textual, or hermeneutical dimensions. That paranormality is implicitly about meaning and about the act of interpretation. It's about information, communication, and mediation. Indeed, he puts forward his central point that Paranormal phenomena are semiotic or hermeneutical phenomena in the sense that they signal, symbolize, or speak across a gap between the conscious socialized ego and an unconscious, sorry, or superconscious field. Contact with alienated, autonomous entities, something familiar to the intrepid psychedelic explorer, particularly on high doses 
of DMT, psilocybin, and other tryptamines, ketamine, salvia divinorum, and others. And if anyone's wondering, yes, there is my shopping list of anti <laughs> encounters that I've had myself. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. These experiences certainly qualify as paranormal experiences. In my model, ineffable otherness can map onto what Kripal is claiming to be some kind of unconscious or superconscious field. He's hedging his bets there. Kripal clarifies stating in what I find to be some of his most beautiful phrasing. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> Where's it gone? <laughs> okay, you'll get the phrasing from me. <laughs> paranormal phenomena still become, sorry, paranormal phenomena become the still unacknowledged, unassimilated other of modern thought. <laughs> the fleeting signs of a consciousness not yet become culture. Of a consciousness not yet become culture. Out with culture beyond the field of language, the utterly novel, experientially entirely alien, ineffable, incommunicable otherness. This is something that psychonauts and serious psychedelic explorers are well versed with, direct experiences of novelty that are utterly unlanguageable. As we've all noticed though, this does nothing to prevent those who've had such experiences trying to relay them to us over <laughs> and over again. So I'm being playful here, of course, but it's not just the psychedelic community that is full of bores obsessed with the profundity of their own trip experiences. It is actually a fundamental property of off-culture more broadly, as noted by Kreipel and Wouter Hanegraaff when discussing mystical-like experiences of noetic wisdom or gnosis. It is a paradox often noted, <laughs> the ineffable tends to produce an almost believable prolixity, that which cannot be said, gets said again, again, <laughs> sorry, gets said and said and said. So it's not just, it's not just your boring mate that won't stop telling you about this amazing trick. Okay. So to be clear, I'm definitely not trying to fetishize or elevate this notion of ineffable otherness. It's not what it is, but rather what it does. It's both concealed and revealed by its expression into the cultural field or cultural fabric. Such otherness cannot be articulated, so necessarily it must transcend culture because it cannot be transmitted through forms of communication from one individual to the next. However, it can still impact directly on culture, mediated by way of these pop cultural expressions out of the cultural fabric, altering the cultural landscape. Mm. Now, it may well be that various forms of entity encounters are exactly what they appear to be. Interactions and communications with DMT elves, aliens, angels, demons, Channeled, channeled hyperdimensional beings, ancestor spirits, and so on and so forth. But, as William Robinson, yeah, we're expecting that, weren't you, said at this very conference in one of these symposia in 2015, quote, don't ask an elf about his ontological status. They are self-transforming. It's not in the elven spirit to be categorized, end quote. <laughs> Similarly, when author and magician Alan Moore spoke at one of my events, he explained his mercurial position regarding the objective reality of what, what certainly seemed to be entity encounters within his magic and psychedelic drug practice. He also pointed out that with respect to the experiential content of such an encounter, if you want it to go well, it's best not to question the ontological status of the entities that you are encountering. More than anything, it's a terrible social faux pas and downright rude. <laughs> Best have the encounter run smoothly as possible and parse its ultimate validity a bit later on when the entity isn't around to be offended. <laughs> <laughs> this model that I'm proposing, though, allows for ambiguity and multi-model agnosticism, even naturalist or psychologized interpretations. Because in this model, the ineffable otherness that is being encountered, which could legitimately be an elf, is encountered through the cultural fabric of a given time and place. And so the occultural extrusions 
can be understood as to express themselves in relativistic forms. These forms need not be taken literally and can be understood as allegorical because the truth of their nature is necessarily veiled. The message itself can be the intermediary. The exoteric expression of psychedelic all culture, like all forms of all culture, can be understood as the mediation of experiences of otherness that transcend language and culture. Within culture, all culture mediates some form of alienated agency from beyond the field of language. It is then read, interpreted, politically negotiated, intercommunicated within culture, but always signposting, always pointing back to some mysterious, alienated, non-linguistic source. The experience itself, the impact on the subject experiencing it, and the subsequent impact on the interconnected wider culture is what I believe to be the most generous as a subject of research. These entities could well be as they appear to be. DMT elves may well be hyperdimensional critters. And to be fair, every time I've met them, they're pretty bloody convincing. <laughs> I mean, I'm genuinely not ruling it out at the point that I'm making. But equally, entity encounters of all kinds could be the result of some kind of internal mental process, some incredibly deep unconscious of the individual or a fragmented piece of dissociated psyche or an encounter with some more fundamental shared field of consciousness, perhaps coextensive to all life, or it could even be driven by some materialist evolutionary biological function, or we could be making contact with a hyperdimensional object casting a shadow into matter, as the late great Terence McKenna would say, some external platonic absolute other or superconsciousness, as Kreitel puts it. While these musings and speculations and various belief systems are endlessly fascinating and people will continue to assert the veracity of their various metaphysical claims, I also recognize there is no objective or verifiable way of knowing. Are we talking to others? Are we talking to ourselves? Is there even a difference? Who knows? What I do know is that experiences of encountering alienated autonomous agencies are more accessible and perhaps more normal than many, especially in the West, might think. In that, it is entirely feasible that this is a, a fundamental function of our consciousness because we are not so singular as we might seem. And I was almost screaming out for joy during your talk, Andy, so thank you. And I'm going like, we are ecologies. We are complexes. We are plural systems. So to close, here's that handbrake. To close, I want to send you off down a rabbit hole I fell down last year. And I've already sent a few others down in the last day or so. If you're a fan of the weird and wonderful and fascinated by entity phenomena, consider having a look into the contemporary occultural phenomenon of tulpamancy. I actually made this slide and halfway through uh, realized that it clearly objectifies women and is sexist. Uh, so, but fortunately the internet was way ahead of me. <laughs> it was easily fixed. <laughs> so somewhere between 2009 and 2012, there's been a thriving online subculture of so-called tulpamancers. Those that engage in the creation of self-invented companion entities. Tulpamancy is the undertaking of a number of techniques and practices that seek to create and sustain, sustain tulpa, that is, autonomous and sentient entities with their own alienated agency within the shared body of a host system. Similar in some ways to dissociative identity disorder, <coughs> disorder tulpamancy, however, is not psychopathological. Studies have shown quite the opposite. It has therapeutic benefits. And it's done, as Terence McKenna would say, on the natch. <laughs> Given their agents and sentience, the rights and privileges of Tulpa are a fundamental concern for the community. Personhood is designated to the Tulpa, even with the commonly held understanding amongst Tulpa masters themselves that they're entirely fabricated forms of self-consciousness. Although they share the host's body, Tulpa's autonomy and sentience means that they can be subject to psychological abuse and trauma. 
Concerns of cruelness and consent, especially with regard to the sometimes taboo subject of sexual relationships with one's own topper, are issues that are taken very seriously. The host is collectively grouped with talpas as a system. Note that the host is only primary in a chronological sense. After the host transitions to a plural, multiple conscious system, any talpa can participate in the creating or individually create additional talpas from that point on. Talpa systems can even have nested subsystems. So talpas can create talpas and they can create talpas. This is a real thing. And this is a really fun bit for anyone that studies tulpamancy where you get to give a direct quote from a tulpa themselves. This is Shinyu Wolfi. Shinyu is a tulpa and an important vocal and active community member and moderator on a number of tulpa forums. The only thing that set tulpa apart is that they are created artificially via their tulpamancy practice. Due to this, tulpas have to be younger than the physical body, which creates a feeling of superiority for the host. But, in fact, no such superiority exists and any topper can grow to the same mental level as a host and surpass them and even replace them. And that does happen. This is individuals creating an entirely different consciousness in their own host system and then switching out and not being that person anymore, being a different person. <laughs> a fascinating link here is that narration Internally narrating to an emerging talpa is a key technique in their creation, which is something we all do with respect to our own selves. One tells a story to give an indication of who they are, and this is a very natural and normal thing to do because not only do stories constitute the semiotic soup and codified cultural fabric within which we are embedded, we in turn have an inherent narrativity. We experience and relate our life as story. Narration is not just a technique for producing tulpa, but for reinforcing our own sense of self. This is a well understood phenomenon and is known as the narrative self or narrative identity. Anil Seth, professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience and an important voice in consciousness research, posits that the self is better understood as an integrated network of processes, a complex of different selves. Included in this is the narrative self, described as where the I comes in. In the experience of being a continuous and distinctive person over time, this narrative self, the story we tell ourselves about who we are, is built from a rich set of autobiographical memories that are associated with a particular subject. As a quick aside, I can confirm that Seth has some knowledge and perhaps some interest in Tobamansi, because just a couple of months ago, this popped up on his Twitter feed. That's Michael Lifswitch at the annual meeting of the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness talking about Tulpamancy. And if there's any discordians or chaos magicians in the room, yeah, you'll notice it was the 23rd. <laughs> For those that like the 23rd, 23, yeah. So there isn't enough time to unpack a great deal more of this now, and trust me, the rabbit hole runs deep. I haven't even touched on Tulpamancy's relationship with My Little Pony. Yeah, with an unexpected connection to my little pony. <laughs> Honestly, go away and look it up. It's the best fun you'll ever have. <laughs> might stop you getting on with your own research that you're supposed to be doing now. Uh, but in my ongoing PhD work, I'm finding very rich interrelationships between self-writing, cultural engineering, remix culture, the revisioning of cultural texts, and the enchanting bricolage that is our culture. I'm just going to leave you with one of my favourite bits of information about Tulpamancy. Probably the most academically uh, rigorous study yet undertaken of Tulpamancy published by Samuel Bessier in 2015 called Varieties of Tulpa Experiences, Sentient Imaginary Friends, Embodied Joint Attention and Hypnotic Sociality in a Wired World. It's a pretty great title. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best bit though, you haven't the icing and the cake. Uh, for this piece of work, 
The Research Ethics Board was concerned with the anonymity and protection of the Tulsa persons as well as their hosts. Something Bessier notes is a rather hopeful development in the legal definitions of personhood. This both blew my mind and delighted me in equal measure. So I look forward to a future DMT and Encounter Experience Symposium where we can entirely dispense with being concerned about questions of ontology and who knows, maybe we'll even find ourselves discussing the ethical concerns and implicit personhood of our DMT elephant king. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.